All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, you're here to talk about using play to build culture. I'm going to pause my music, so I'm not trying to compete with this gorgeous singing that I cannot emulate. Um, welcome, welcome, folks. My name is Gabe O'Brien. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm here today in my capacity as an educational consultant through um, an independent business called Leveled Up Learning um, that I started. Um, and and while you're sharing your value, again, um, I'm going to drop that link in chat so folks who are just joining us um, can see. Um, if you could share your name and pronouns in chat, organization, role, and then fill out the Mentimeter, be greatly appreciated. So, so today we're talking about how to use um, play in organizational culture. This, this is applicable to business, but also um, in classrooms or on a sports team, in other environments, wherever you might find yourself. And so recently I've been working with, with uh, Lamb Research, which um, is a, a Fortune 500 company. And it was very intriguing to find how tough the organizational culture was. A lot of these engineers, um, chemical engineers, right? Like traditional electric engineers, and, and it really brought me to this. And I started to like do a case study on like what was happening here to evaluate it. And so it was, when I was preparing for this, I was thinking about this time when I was down East, I was in Machias and I was work doing direct youth work. And one day I was sitting in my office doing my reporting for anybody who is worked in nonprofits or had to do reporting, you know how fun that is. So I, I was definitely not getting distracted, but my coworker, Brian showed up with his son, Kevin, uh, um, who had recently and was expressing having difficulty in school, just had just recently gone into the high school and um, wasn't loving it. And conversation quickly erupted because again, I was looking to do anything but my reporting. Um, and I welcomed that distraction. And I began asking questions. It's like, what, what's something that makes you like, what do you like to do on, on your ideal Saturday? What are you, what are you doing? Um, and I quickly learned that Kevin was a huge gamer. He loved video games. And fortunately, I do too. I love video games. But Brian quickly added, like, video games are actually part of the thing that's impacting Kevin's grades. He's staying up too late playing them. And I could hear this subtext of video games are going to rot your brain. Games are things you need to age out of and grow out. I, I recognize the subtext because my mom said that to me all the time too. She hated video games. And me and my two older brothers love them. And so it was this constant tension. Um, and, and so as a fellow gamer, I, I noticed and I spoke that language, which for Kevin, I could see his eyes just lit up. And we proceeded to have a conversation. Um, and he then said, I actually have my PC, my computer in my dad's truck. I'll, I'll go get it. He rushes out, he goes to the truck, pulls it up, brings it up. And soon enough, he's playing For Honor, which is a, a pretty intense video game on my work monitor, which was like the best thing in the world. So I'm sitting on the ground watching him talk me through all the things he's doing. He's part of this guild where they're doing all this stuff. And I see him no longer like upset and sad. He was like engaged. And what this, what this was so telling for me was Kevin wasn't struggling with school. He was struggling feeling like he belonged. He was struggling to find a place where his interests, his passions were shared and a place where he could be himself and really engage in, in conversations and the things that excited him. So time goes by and, and Kevin's still uh, struggling with school, and, but he keeps staying in communication. And so finally, one day I'm like, all right, Kevin, like, I hear you're really struggling. Like, what do we do about this? If like no restrictions, no no limit on what you're able to do. What would you, what would you do? Like, what would you do to change the culture? Um, and he goes, well, I've thought a lot about this. I would hire or bring all of these really big streamers and he name dropped a couple, Shroud, um, Pokimane, like these huge streamers who are making millions of dollars playing video games for eight hours a day on Twitch. And he's like, I would invite them all to do this panel about what are the different aspects of how you find this career. Like there's video editing you need to do. There's brand development. You have to like network and outreach all of these things that are really important that people don't see and people don't see it as a legitimate career. I was like, all right, Shroud makes $2 million. So we're not going to be able to get him. I don't know Shroud personally, so we can't bring him into this space. What could we do instead? 
And through some more questions and conversation, Kevin was like, I think what it is about me is people don't understand technology. I see my teachers trying to use their computers or their smart boards and I know how to do it. And I don't, and, and I see my peers not like being interested. They play Xbox, but they don't understand how, like once their Xbox works, they throw it on and get a new one. And so what we got to was Kevin was really interested in how computers work. And so Kevin went on to organize a community event at the Machias Recovery Center. Um, and it was called Tech Takeover. And what we did is we brought every generation of video game back from Super Nintendo all the way up through virtual reality. So we had Xbox 360, Xbox One, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 2, and 64s. And then we had this whole section of VR, which Kevin brought in to show people to do virtual reality. So we were playing Beat Saber. We were doing all this stuff. And then also, um, Kevin went around and asked a bunch of people to donate old computers that were just lying around. And so we had a whole table of just laptops open on this table where people could be like, what's this? And I'd go, oh, let's Google it. And so now we're ripping apart this technology. We're looking around and simultaneously we're playing all these games. And to this day, you can see like how excited I am about this, both because Kevin went from someone who was struggling in school to someone who was deeply connected to his community, working within a recovery community, responding to an opiate crisis, right? This thing that we are trying to still unlock through providing outlets for young people to connect to passions before we're on this road. So it was a blast. It was so much fun. I share this because, again, what I heard from Kevin was people didn't care to ask what, what he valued. And there wasn't an, an outlet or a space for him to explore that, to cultivate this interest and to learn more. And as soon as Kevin had people, not just me, but other community members saying, whoa, what are you doing? Right? Like the recovery center was great. Marshall, who ran it, was like asking what's going on here? What's going on here? And Kevin just led him around the space and was teaching, right? He was in the space where he was valued and seen. How we build relationships. This is the core of what we're going to talk about today. How we build relationships and the moments we invest in combine to create the culture. This isn't something that hap always happens intentionally. Culture's there whether we want it to be or not. And it's about recognizing the things we're doing that build to that culture and then be intentional about how we create it. And then most importantly, sustain it because it's easy to do an event. It's hard to then do the follow-up and keep investing. Creating culture is easy. Sustaining it is really hard work. So one of the ways we can invest in these moments, right? All these micro moments, the questions we ask, the way that I engage Brian, the father, to think differently about how video games can be connected to the work he was so deeply passionate about. All these tiny little moments took a moment of intentionality about how we invite people to show up with their values and their passions. And so there's a reason why Google it not just invites or allows, but encourages employees to spend 20% of their time on passion projects, partly because it makes them a lot of money. So Google isn't the best model, but there's a reason they do that. And that's because they encourage their employees to play. They encourage their employees to have fun because when we're doing things we love, we wanna come back and do it again. We wanna keep investing in those micro moments to cultivate a culture and community we wanna be a part of. So forms of play like games are so important because it provides teams and individuals opportunity to build trust, to build relationships because the moments of play I think back when me and my brothers were playing Legos and then all of a sudden my brother took the block that I wanted and now I'm yelling at him, right? Now we're having like a conversation. We're getting into conflict, which is really important. We're talking and communicating on how we want to navigate sharing and, and scaffolding that up to a more professional environment besides my brothers and I on the floor of our playroom where we're like, man, I felt really betrayed by the fact that this person took my project idea and is now doing it without checking with me. I can now find a way to trust that person and say, hey, that sucked. And it's through those play where we can build that trust and those relationships in order to like get in there. Uh, but it's hard. And so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be entering with our values and we're going to be playing a game. We're going to be playing a game that I absolutely adore. It's, it's, I did not come up with it, but it's something that um, through my day job, 
um, we do through the main youth action network through restorative practices. And so before I do that, I want to present our, our values that we have here. Cause one of the things that I like to do, um, whenever I'm working with a new group is community norms are really important, but more important to me is what's beneath the norms. Why are we valuing those norms? And so this is why I asked you about what's the value you bring to your work? What, what is intrinsic in you that you bring and show up to space with? And so we can see here the cultivation of the values of this space. Are people able to see that? Just like thumbs up if fantastic. So we can see relationships are pretty central to, to this. We see courage, island perspective, love, presence. This tells me so much more than someone saying, please be respectful, right? Because I don't, respectful means so much more things. And right, and like oftentimes be respectful was used to control people from sharing, right? It wasn't respectful for certain people to talk out. This tells me so much more about you folks. And this gives me a framework to now enter into this conversation to ask questions like, what do we do if our behaviors aren't matching up with these values? What if I'm not listening? What if I'm not investing in relationships? I would like to take a moment. I, I see folks are, are continuing to introduce themselves in chat. Would anybody care to come off mute and, and share what they're noticing about the values that this group collectively holds? What do you notice? Well, I, I don't mind saying I, it seems like everything's related by working with other people, not working alone. Like all of these words seem to be like, depending on other people, I mean, well, dependable's on there, but you know what I mean? Yeah, we really value being in teams. We wanna be part of a community, Heather. That's fantastic. And really central to the core of why I'm sure folks showed up today, because how do we do that effectively? And how do we stay part of the community? Yeah, anyone else have a observation or thought? Folks, I'm used to working with teenagers, so awkward silence is not awkward for me, just FYI, as many of you I'm sure are aware. I think kind of bouncing off of what Heather said about us needing um, a, a team space, it also very much comes down, a lot of these tools come down to communication and building. Mm a positive space as well. Like you can't have positive communication without having empathy, without having love for the other person, without having a flexibility in your conversation. Yeah. Folks, I'm from a small rural town where politeness is really, really important. And sometimes I'm not communicating what I need to my teammates because of that contextual experience. And how do we navigate who we are with that communication element? Ellen, I see you have your hand up, which is so polite. Um, thank you. And also, don't feel like you need to raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I was thinking that, especially as a first grade teacher, that um, kids don't necessarily come to school having all of these skills to persevere or be innovative or compassionate or um, to just be dependable or... Um, yeah be patient. So I think, you know, there needs to be explicit instruction on teaching them all of those skills. It doesn't just happen automatically. So taking yes. that into consideration and sometimes behavior is the result of those lagging skills and not um, because they just want to misbehave. It's because they just don't know how to behave or haven't learned strategies yet. Yes, Alan, thank you so much. That's so central to what we're gonna talk about today. As people who have responsibility as leaders, whether it's running a classroom, running a team at work, we have a responsibility and just saying, all right, you know, Alan, you have to trust these people now. It's not how that works. 
That's mm-hmm. not the way relationships are built. And so it's our responsibility to think of how do we scaffold the skill building necessary for, for collaboration, for empathy building, just like you said, Alan, that's so insightful and so important because too, it leads back to some of these components that I was talking about in the beginning of where do we go from here? How do we actually cultivate these skills? And what is my responsibility in that? So I'm gonna stop sharing, but we're gonna come back to this. Um, I just wanted to say, I love yeah. the word cultivate. <laughs> I, love I use it a lot. <laughs> so that's good. Instead of educate, it's, you know, cultivate. That's really cool. Yeah. And it's also like the other part of you, what you said is when we see conflict, right? Whether that's an individual's behavior with the learning experience or whether it's between two, two folks. So I'm a, I'm a state, uh, state certified mediator in New York. And part of what we're taught to look for is it's not about the behavior. It's what are they needing and how is the behavior communicating going back to our values, how is it communicating a violation maybe in the values that one person holds that the other person doesn't realize? For example, like storytelling, I love to talk and I love to tell stories. So when I'm not given that space, I can feel really like sequestered and that can manifest as frustration, right? And so being able to be patient and listen and hear the needs and values of your team is so important. And it looks a lot different with middle schoolers and adults, but, uh, a, a really, really important mentor of mine said, adults are just grown kids. And a lot of them didn't get what they needed along the way. So folks, we're going to go into a breakout room in a moment. I'm saying that because Yvonne and I did, I did not tell Yvonne I was going to be doing this. Um, so we're going to go into teams of four or five. It could be randomly sorted. But in your groups, while you're doing this, oh, someone already voted. That's awesome. I don't know if I did this beforehand, but... Um, we're going to be going into a, a scenario and I'll, I'll describe it for a second. Did this show up on the Mentimeter, by the way, folks? Um, it did. I, I think I might be the person who, um, who I just went into the Mentimeter. I was like, oh, there's a new question. So sorry about that. I just no, <laughs> no, no, no. Don't apologize. That's fantastic. I was nervous it wasn't going to work because I haven't done the present thing. I've only ever done. Anyway, more context than you needed. Um, So anyway, so what we're going to be doing, and you're welcome to vote now or hear what we're going to do, but I love the enthusiasm about the scenario. So we're going to break into groups. And in those groups, we're going to tackle this scenario that you're that you're choosing from. Um, And and the core component of what we're going to try and do is not develop a plan to actually do this, but talk about what is the role we want to play in this group. How are we going to collaborate and organize with other folks? This is also known as an activity called Mission Possible. So we are taking an impossible scenario, right? Like Kevin felt like it was impossible to change the culture of his community and his school. It was terrifying. It was hard. But then we found a way to do that. And part of that was through the relationships and team that he built. And hearing that teamwork is a value of this group, I'm particularly excited to see how we collaborate with each other in order to do that. So in in a moment, you're gonna go into breakout groups and then I'm gonna share a Jamboard link for you all. Um, For those of you, I'm gonna stop sharing this Mentimeter. Um, So keep voting um, in that, but I'm sharing this Mentimeter or Jamboard. Slowly, slowly. I have to make you all editors because with this Jamboard, open that, make sure you can edit it. Google sometimes does not cooperate with me. But so you're going to go into breakout groups and then pay attention to which breakout group you're in because that will correspond to the Jamboard that you're on. For those of you who might not be familiar with Jamboard, um, what you're gonna be doing is these are the questions that you're gonna work through, the prompts you're gonna work through as a team in response to the prompt that that selected, which I think is probably gonna be develop an underwater community center dedicated to the preservation of mermaids. I think that's what folks were voting for. So through each step, you're gonna decide who's your leader. You're gonna ask what are the different roles for your team? What is like the job description maybe or other aspects you wanna explore? And then assign each group member in uh, each member in your team a role and base it off of actual strengths that you have. And then finally, you're going to consider who are the other partners you need to work with. So again, you're going to go into breakout group, pay attention to which room you're in, 
And then that's the Jamboard you're going to work on. To toggle between Jamboards at the top, you can click left or right, and that will take you to boards. And then in order to add to this, I would love if you take notes here. You can either um, drop sticky notes by, I did that really fast, come over here to this bar, drop sticky notes if you want to track your notes, or you can just double click under here um, and add stuff. What else do you need before I send the, you um, It looks like the, we need access. Of course you do. Of course, of course you do. Anything else while I wrestle with Google? Um, you want, if we do four breakout rooms, that'll be about four people in each room. A couple of rooms will have four five. to five. Yeah, is that is fantastic. Okay. And just want to make sure everybody has the jam board before we go. Cause I don't, then I don't know what happens with the chat after that. If we, yeah, it doesn't, we have our own chats and I can't remember how it works, but, um, let's see. All right, folks, I'm not going to spend waste more of your time trying to figure out the tech. So I apologize about that. If you could just assign one person to take notes, whether it's on a computer or on a piece of paper, that's fine. We're going to come back together and share out. And so also think about who's going to present on your work since we can't, we're not going to be able to see and track your progress. Okay. So each group should have a note taker and a presenter. That is correct. Okay. And do you want to tell us the instructions again? Sure. So you are going out into your groups and you are working to develop an underwater community center dedicated to the preservation of mermaids. Um, and I will drop the prompts in chat so you have them and can write them down. Um, the first one is who is the leader of your group? What are the different roles for your team? And assign each member of your team a role based on their actual strengths. And then who are the additional partners you're gonna wanna be working with? Those are in chat, so you can have them when you're in your breakout groups. I apologize about that Jamboard once again. Um, and any other questions before we go save the mermaids? Welcome back, mermaid, uh, or I should say community underwater building experts. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Um, I see some grins, which hopefully means we were successful um, in our efforts. All right, folks, tell me what you learned. Tell me what you did. Who, who wants to go first and share a little bit about their project? Yes, Alan, kick us off. Got to unmute yourself, Alan. Yeah. Hi. Um, so in our group, um, I was the, well, obviously the presenter and the note taker. And we also had um, active participants and observers in the discussion. Pat was our leader. Um, and Pat, as our leader, really wanted to focus on um, using what's existing in the environment instead of going in and like building something that's like man-made and not part of the environment and trying to keep it as, um, well, to preserve the environment, not just preserving the mermaids. Um, so at first we had all of these jobs of like engineer, architect, and programmers and social workers and code enforcement officers. And, and then we just kind of moved from that realm into more like we would want oceanographers and biologists to help us best maintain the environment. Um, but we did say we wanted like a media consultant or a school liaison so that um, we could have like poster contests, um, about like save the mermaid or don't throw trash in the water or um, just, you know, getting the word out there that there was trouble in Mermaid City and um, that they needed help. So it was a community effort, not just a underwater yeah. Yeah. effort. Um, and uh, so let's see. So just again, using the natural environment structures and um, making sure that programming included um, exercise and spa um, opportunities, um, that there was a chef, um, because this is all about emotional well being, as well as, you know, like providing um, opportunities for 
growth and um, maybe work opportunities. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. That's what we were Thanks, Alan. Those are some lucky mermaids. All right. Which group wants to go next and share a little bit about what their team discussed? I'll volunteer our group. Yeah. And then we'll come to you, Bria. Let's say I've strong oppositions. Uh, before I just start talking, did anyone else in my group want to talk? I don't want to just assume that no one else wanted to. No. Okay. All right. Get <laughs> talking. Um, so we, we started breaking down, sorry, I'm pulling up my notes that we had. Um, we originally, when we first started the conversation, instantly jumped into looking at like, we're going to need to discuss the physical center needs versus like the business administrative, more person-based physical center needs. And then that ended up, um, kind of jumping us into a brainstorming question as we were really starting to look at roles um, and those questions included things like do the mermaids even want our help uh, in preservation kind of catching back to our keynote where we were um, talking about at times people inserting themselves into things because they feel like they should but it's not always wanted um, are the mermaids under stress? How do we process the next steps if they are? Um, and so that kind of, that tangented us Love just it. a little bit into this brainstorming session. Um, so the roles that we kind of quickly identified as um, key points, especially once those questions were posed, um, was the need for ambassadors between the human slash land living creatures in case there are other like centaurs or other land living creatures. We had a whole <laughs> ethical UN at one point, um, but also like an ambassador from the mermaids so that they actually have a voice in this center dedicated around them. Um, Heather identified our need for a builder and a kind of overall constructor of this community. Um, as well as our research team. So if this project were to progress farther, what can the research team do to support the development of the center to make sure that it's actually beneficial to the parties that it's preserving and celebrating and actually being healthy as we could go from there. And then David kind of quick put in as we were running out of time, but he made the excellent point that we do need some sort of center chair person or team to really help encompass everyone and kind of keep us on the right path of our mermaid center. So it's, it's at the very base level, our center is, but we're getting there. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Hey folks, just for time, I want to invite the other teams to, to join the space if they want to share some, some cool things that their, their group came up with, um, but also want to get to some of the debrief questions. So um, Bria, I know you had your hand and wanted to share something, so I'd love to come to you and hear hear some from your team. Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Um, our organization for the community center is called CWMP, <laughs> which is the Cold Water Mermaid Preserve. Um, uh, our we named Jen um, Final Haven as part of our team as our director because she was really able to needle in on our mission, which is about addressing the specific needs of. Uh, of mermaids who live in cold waters, given that these waters are warming. And then we were able to identify some roles for each of us, um, given like our aptitudes mm. and um, and talents. And um, Marcella and Ilaho is also on our team. So she is our, our landscape designer and designer of the space education director. But I think our richest conversation was about who else needs to be at the table, which I feel like it was for a lot of people. And um, the scientists and anthropologists, I think were the people we kept coming back to. So who are the experts in the room that can help us understand the experiences of the mermaids themselves? And there's a lot more to our organization if anyone wants to know. I love that. And we already have an acronym. Um, we truly are in the nonprofit realm, folks. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. And the last group, did you have anything else you wanted to add or share that was a little bit different from your conversation? Um, I think it's us. Um, yeah. I, it was me. Katie, uh, Brooke from um, Vinyl Haven and Oda from Islesboro. And uh, it's interesting, you guys are so 
conscious of the mermaids needs and we were more like i think thinking of the mermaids as almost like a product like mm. like an aquarium so um like you know taking care of them but sort of infantilizing them in a way so we had um like the we were going to partner with the aquarium um and we had like paul nicklin to take photos and we were going to have agents and producers to like make videos and and um and and U Uda was our um our outreach coordinator and look we even have our first one this is my cousin <laughs> so um yeah I think that's different because we were you know kind of thinking of them more like oh we need to conserve them we need to take care of them not really thinking of their voice so much although we did have this idea that maybe we needed to work with the UN because maybe there could be like warring groups of mermaids like mermaids from like Ireland or mermaids from you know East Asia or something and and do they have to have separate habitats and things fantastic thanks for sharing folks you put a lot of thought and energy into this um, I'm curious if we know if mermaids are real or not, because we've just built out like four distinct organizations dedicated to the preservation of them, which is really intriguing to me. And surprisingly, I mean, I'm really interested in your projects, but also that's not why I asked you to do this. And I'm curious about how it felt to be in a group planning for this, I hope, fairly like ridiculous situation. What were you thinking as you were going through it? Yeah, Ellen. Well, I was I was quite enamored with the whole thing. And, you know, there was the the kind of uh, jovial side of the discussions. But, you know, and then, oh, well, we've really got to, you know, stick to task. And and we weren't quite sure if we were humans entering their realm, if we were supportive mermaids. Um, but I just think that kids would I mean, kids of whatever age, adults, would enjoy the conversation that comes out of this because it's fun, but it's an enriching conversation. And because of the different perspectives yeah. that come into play or the different um, hobbies or likes or dislikes, I could see you know kids really like almost debating like why you could or could not have a component as part of this environment. So I just think it opens up for a really rich conversation. Yeah, we're talking about this fictional thing, but we're really talking about real issues. I heard every most groups bring up diversity, equity, and belonging. And to name, I use belonging very intentionally instead of inclusion because including someone isn't enough for me. I want them to feel like they belong, which we don't always control, but it's really important to me. So just to name, I'm using that language very specifically. And so that's a huge conversation. <laughs> that's a big one. We're still figuring it out. So thanks for that, Ellen. Yeah, David. Yeah, I just we we brought up in our group, um, kind of building off that something that doesn't have literally does not have a voice, and the similarities between the mermaids and right whales. Yeah, um, that many a lot of this everything that we've talked about. If you if you say that the mermaids to, cannot cannot communicate, well, everything could be linked linked to this. Yeah. And how do we begin to do that work? Right. And to like both what I heard Katie and Bria share was in their groups, they were talking about, all right, this is like a form of activism, but how do we do something not just for, but with, right. And so thinking about taking this back into your organizations, how do we develop power structures where we're not just doing for, but we're really doing with, and, and not just with the people your organization serves, but within, because the things that we do and model to our employees, to our young people, to our peers, becomes the behavior they see and then the behavior they emanate. And so that's really important to think about is like, how are we creating these spaces where we can model those conversations so that it's a, we can have it? Because people aren't always going to have the same political views as us, the same value systems. Coming back to that first question that I asked, so how do we find the common ground in order to do that? So with that, what are the things you learned? What are the other things you saw where are you going to bring this back to your work? I think it's a smart idea to um, uh, present a problem that's super fictional, we think, we think, super yeah. fictitious, 
<laughs> um, it really allows kids to be really creative, but then like we just brought this all the way back to like you can make that more concrete and it allow there's not a worry about being right or wrong because you can say anything you want about something so fictitious. So that make, they, it allows for more um, discussion and everyone has an entry level and they don't need a content knowledge yeah. to start. That's cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that allows a conduit to real problem solving. Alan. Um, I was thinking like with the first graders, one of the biggest issues is like um, interpersonal relationships or um, playground being able to get along with each other. So maybe just saying a, a short scenario, very minimal words, but see what generates out of just um, merry-go-round. Yeah. Because I know that they'll all start talking about, well, this is a rule, but so-and-so really doesn't follow that rule. And, you know, well, so-and-so actually lifts his legs and swings around. And, but I mean, it could lead to a discussion on what is expected as opposed to unexpected and, and just making it relevant to things in their little lives. It might, doesn't have to be like a real heavy subject yeah. at this level, but it would be, again, enriching conversation and because they're coming up with the ideas and it's their words and their thoughts. I think it just makes more of an impact on them. Yeah. The focus right here. I didn't ask you how you were going to build this. I asked you what your role was. What are your strengths? How do you contribute to it? And who else do you need to work with? And we need to center relationships. And part of what I hope experience was and hearing every group really build trust within their group in order to go out and do and talk about the things of how they wanted to participate is central to building organizational culture. And you can do it through playing a game. In fact, playing a game makes it a lot easier. I know we're at time and I know Yvonne wants to share some great updates about what's coming next. And also I'm sure people are hungry uh, <laughs> to get some lunch. 